Ruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Um, we are, again, about to begin our lecture on my thought. So the topic of my thought this week uh, is about Korach. There are only six Torah portions that are named after a person. So why would the Torah name a portion after an individual whose quest for honor threatened the very core of our belief system? His rebellion against Moshe questioned not only the appointments that Moshe had made, such as placing his brother Aaron as the high priest, but even basic questions of Judaism, such as the laws of the mitzvot of tzitzit, for the fringes and the mezuzah that we put on our door. The Rambam wrote in his Savva, his last Roman testament, something very important. He, did, he, he wrote, Do not contaminate your souls with arguments and strife, which destroy one's body, soul, and money. I've seen white that turned into black, dignitaries humiliated, families driven apart, officers demoted from high positions, large cities shaken, groups separated, individuals lost, men of faith destroyed and respected people scorned as a result of strife. Prophets, wise men, and philosophers have all despised it and fled from it. They distanced themselves from all who loved it, its proponents and adherents. Now, even if your family loves arguments, be strong and stay away from them. At least you be swept away because of their iniquity. You know, from Korach and his followers, we learn the danger of arguments. Many times they begin really with the best of intentions and righteous ideals. But then ego and pride take over. So that which started out as a mitzvah, a good deed, in the end becomes an avera, a sin. Korach's complaint started out as a desire to serve God Almighty on a much higher level. It ended up with him questioning and trying to undermine the basis of the truth of the Torah. He already served as one of the four people who merited to carry the ark. But instead of coming closer to God and serving him in a higher capacity, he questioned the basis of all the Torah. Karak challenged Moshe's position as the conduit between God and man. What began as a quest to elevate his religiosity ended with the destruction of himself, his family, and all of his followers. Had he been successful in his challenge, it would have threatened the very core of all of our beliefs in God and in Moshe, his servant. In Mishle, in Proverbs, it is written, the name of the wicked will rot. That being the case, how could the Torah eternalize the name of Korah, a wicked individual who never did tshuva in his lifetime, especially by, by calling a, a sedra, a Porsche, Torah portion, in his name? So the answer must be that Korah was not a sinner in his ideology. His sin was only in the method that he employed to fulfill his thoughts. The fact that he wanted to serve as the high priest was not wrong. In fact, Moshe himself said that he too wanted the position for himself, as Rashi states. So from Korach's actions, we can learn some important lessons in life. One, that we should emulate his good intentions. And two, that there always exists the possibility of real failure in life, no matter how elevated you have become. This teaches us that freedom of choice is totally in our hands. The story of Korach tells us that real success or failure is an option that is possible for all of us in all situations. You know, this possibility of controversy traces its origin all the way back to Adam, first man. Once he was blemished by eating from the eight Adas, from the tree of knowledge. He drew down into this world argumentation and conflict. He introduced negativity that would infect his progeny. We see that immediately after his sin, his two sons began to quarrel among themselves. Their argument was the forerunner of all strife and conflict that would exist throughout history, especially those controversies that existed against righteous individuals. So it was their conflict that spawned the rebellion of Korach and his group. Rav Nachman of Breslov stated that Korach wanted to be like Aaron. However, 
They were both separate individuals, each with their own unique personalities and qualities. But Korach rebelled against being who he was, which provided controversies and strife in his relationship with both people and with God. A person must be who he is. He must be himself. As it states in Pirkei Avot, 114, Hillel said, If I am not for myself, who is for me? But if I am only for myself, then what am I? A person should strive to create unity and peace between opposing factions, since this is one of the ways to mitigate divine decrees. But the question that we have to ask is, what caused Korach to challenge both Moses, Moshe, and Aaron? And we read in the Torah portion of Kisisa that when Moshe came down from the mountain the third time, uh, his face radiated from all of the godliness that his body had internalized while in the presence of God Almighty. The verse says that when Aaron and the people saw that the skin of Moshe's face was shining with a brilliant light, they were afraid to approach him, and so he wore a veil. And still, Korah felt confident challenging Moshe's authority. Our sages tell us he was a prophet. Through prophecy, he was able to foresee that Shmuel Hanavi, that Samuel the prophet, would be his descendant. You know, we recite in the Kabbalah Shabbos, the prayer that we say Friday night, come to Hillam, that Shmuel was greater than Moshe and Aaron together. So knowing this fact, Korah arrogantly saw himself as greater than both of them. The Talmud in Sochem states that while Yosef served as the viceroy of Egypt, he gathered up all the wealth in the world during the years of famine. Since there was so much wealth, Yosef decided to divide it up into three portions, which he did. One part was found by Antoninus, the emperor of Rome. Another part he buried in the desert, which Korach found. And the last part will be revealed with the coming of the Messiah, may come quickly and in our time. Now, based on Korok's personal assessment and his immense wealth, he felt slighted and that he was not offered the priesthood or at least the leadership of the family of Kahas. You know, there's a medrash in Bayerka that tells the story of a man who was watching two birds argue. Their argument turned into a fight and resulted in one of the birds killing the other. When the first bird realized that the second bird was dead, he quickly flew to a special tree with leaves that had miraculous curative powers. He plucked a leaf from the tree and put it under the beak of the dead bird. And immediately, the dead bird came to life. The man who was watching the whole scene was, as you can imagine, highly impressed. And so he went to the tree and plucked off many leaves from its branches and placed them in his sack. He then set out to save the world. At the first city that he came to, he noticed that there was a carcass of a dead lion laying outside the city gates. He took a leaf from his sack and placed it under the nose of the dead lion. Sure enough, the dead lion came back to life. And the first thing that the lion did hmm, was to kill the man with the leaf. The man had a magnificent gift, but he used it inappropriately. And so too with the story of Korah. He was blessed with many talents and qualities, in addition to the fact that he was a prophet. His ability to see into the future, which one would have thought was a blessing, instead, for him it became a stumbling block. It was the cause of his downfall. In life, it's not always what you have, more often than not, it's how you use it. Based, Rashi, based, Rashi based on verse 7, tells us that Karl assumed that because his descendants would be great and righteous individuals, <clears throat> that he would be saved in their merit. He reasoned that if all of these prophets would be his descendants, that it must because be, be because of his greatness. So therefore, when Moshe told Korach and his assembly that only one person would survive the test, he naturally assumed that that one person that would be chosen would have to be him. Korach failed to realize that while his sons were originally involved in his rebellion, in the end, they realized that he was incorrect, and so they did tshuva. God accepted their tshuva, their repentance, and they survived. So Korach's prophecy was correct, 
<clears throat> but his assumption that his descendants' merits would protect him was wrong. It would be his sons rather than Korah, their father, who would be the progenitors of Shmuel and the other prophets. Now this answer does create <clears throat> a, a difficulty. The Talmud in Sanhedrin states that a son provides merit for his deceased father, which means that even though a father may be lacking in his own merit still, those merits that his children, and even those merits of future generations, can stand as advocates in his defense. Based on this statement in the Talmud, why wasn't this the case for Korah? So the answer to this question can be found in the Talmud in Yuma, which states, For one who says, I will sin, and then Yom Kippur will be my atonement, well, then Yom Kippur cannot be his atonement. We are told by our sages that even without tshuva, without repentance, the day of Yom Kippur itself is an atonement. This fact is only true for those sins that we commit that are transgressions between man and God. However, if one eats something that is not kosher with the intent that Yom Kippur will atone for his sin, then no such atonement is possible. The reason is really obvious, since it was the day Yom Kippur itself that caused him to sin. Had he not felt certain that the day of Yom Kippur would be an atonement, then he never would have sinned in the first place. Therefore, that which was the source of his transgression cannot be the source of his atonement. The same concept can be extended to Korah. He used the divine knowledge of his noble prodigy to justify and promote his sinful activities. So, so in a sense, these descendants caused his rebellion. Had they not existed, or had he not been privy to a prophetic vision of the future, well, Korak may never have sinned. So while a son may indeed provide merit for his deceased father, this principle can only be implied in general. However, when the son himself is the very cause of his father's sin, then it is clear that the son's merit cannot save his father. So we see that the fact that Korak was a prophet was not a positive attribute for him. In fact, it turned out to be a negative. Much like the incident with King Shaul when he went to war against the nation of Amalek. He, was, he had been commanded by God to kill out all the people, and so he did. The only person that survived was Agag, the king of Amalek. Shaul was about to kill Agag, however he saw that with divine revelation, prophecy, that Agag's descendants would become righteous converts to Judaism. This caused Shaul to hesitate, and he allowed Agag to live out the night. That night, Agag had relations with a slave woman, which resulted in the birth of Haman. TMI, too much information. This divine prophecy is, was that which caused Shaul to lose his kingship. There is a medrash that states that when Abimavino Abraham was thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nimrod. He was not saved in his own merit. It states that he was saved in the merit of his son Yitzchak and his grandson, Yaakov, both of whom had not even been born yet. From this measure we see that not only our ancestors but also our descendants can serve as a merit for us in times of great need. So even though Korach was not able to benefit from the merits of his righteous descendants, his sons, who did not rely on their merits, did become beneficiaries of their merits. So even though they were originally swallowed up by the earth with their father, they had thoughts of tshuva, of repentance, and together with the merit of their descendants, it was enough to allow them to survive and exit alive at a later time. According to Kabbalah, Korach was a reincarnation of Cain. Cain had, had, had to undergo three Gilgulim, three reincarnations in this world. Those corresponded to the three parts of his soul, the nefesh, the physical, the ruach, the intellectual, and the neshama, the spiritual. These three reincarnations were the Ish Mitzri, the Egyptian taskmaster that Moshe killed, Yisro, Moshe's father-in-law, and Korah. When Moshe killed the Egyptian taskmaster, it says, by Yach Es HaMitzri, and he smote the Egyptian. Now the Hebrew word vayach, and he smote, has a gematria, a numerical value of 36. 
if we add the word itself, makes it 37. 37 is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew name, Hevel. The Hebrew word, Hamitri, the Egyptian, has a gematria, a numerical value of 345, which is the same gematria, numerical value as the name Moshe, our teacher. We read in the portion of Yisrael that when Yisrael came out to the desert to join the Jewish nation, he brought his daughter Tzipora with him. According to Kabbalah, the disagreement between Cain and Hevel was over a third sister. Cain was born as, with a twin sister. Hevel was born as triplets. He had two sisters. The argument between the two brothers concerned who would take his third sister. This argument brought about the first murder in history. So according to Kabbalah, Yisrael was a Gilgal of Cain, and Sipora was a Gilgal of that third sister. So when Yisrael came out to the desert to see Moshe, he brought Sipora, Moshe's wife, with him. In a sense, it was Cain in a state of reincarnation as Yisrael, who was bringing Sipora, the reincarnation of that third sister, back to Moshe, who was the Gilgal of heaven and asking him for forgiveness for his previous actions. Korach's rebellion was just Cain going back to his trait of jealousy, which caused him to kill Hevel originally. Moshe was then instrumental in bringing about Korach's death, which follows the Torah commandment, that if someone has shed innocent blood, then his own blood will be, sp be spilled. The death of Korach was due to the earth swallowing him and taking him down into purgatory alive. This is an example of the punishment fitting the crime. Since it was the same earth that had sinned and hid the evil deed which Cain had done, when it opened its mouth, so to speak, and covered up the blood of Hevel, his brother, Mida, Mida, Keneged Mida, tit for tat. What made Korach's rebellion so grievous? Well, by denying Moshe's authority as God's messenger, they denied the legitimacy of the whole Torah. By denying the messenger, they denied the one who sent him. In their view, if their view would have been accepted, there would have remained no foundation to Torah or prophecy. According to the al -Shil, Moshe had no choice but to react with extreme force. So from the incident of the spies, we learn about the importance of confidence. And from Korach's rebellion, we learn about the consequences of conceit. Though they may seem very similar, in reality, they are worlds apart. Confidence is a trait that is essential for success in any challenge that we face in life. It makes you better, and in addition, it makes all of those around you better. Conceit, on the other hand, is an obstacle to any ende endeavor that we, we attempt. It separates rather than binds. Both the spies and Korach were illustrious individuals. They were at the top of the pyramid of life, and yet, in the end, they fell and lost everything that they had achieved, as it states in Pirkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Fathers. Hillel said, do not trust yourself until the day that you die. The Talmud and Kedoshim states, a person who constantly sees defects in others is, in reality, looking at themselves, since they, more often than not, possess those same defects. Korach had a distorted perception of Moshe and his leadership. He entertained these thoughts about Moshe because he was simply casting his own character flaws on him. As the Holy Baal Shem Tov has told us, the world around us acts as a mirror. What we see in others is more often than not a reflection of the negativity that is festering within ourselves. So let us look at the story of Korach and realize that the game isn't over until it's over. We always need to stay focused on what God wants from us and, and not on what we want from God. And with that thought in mind, let us merit to usher in the coming of Messiah to Cana <clears throat> quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. God should bless you with happiness and health and uh, success and safety. Again, Shabbat Shalom. And again, thank you once again for attending.